that the news from the Battle of Waterloo was delivered to Nathan Rothschild a full 24 hours before Wellington's own courier. Being a day ahead of the curve, Nathan played a clever trick. At that time, British bonds were called consuls, and upon hearing Britain had won the war, Nathan began selling all his consuls. This made the other traders believe the British had lost the war, and in a frantic panic, they started selling too. The effect of this was that the consuls plummeted in value. Nathan then discreetly told all his workers to start buying up the consuls they could lay their hands on. When news came through that the British had in fact won the war the next day, the value of the console skyrocketed, giving Nathan a 20 to 1 return on his investment. Feeling rather pleased with himself at this stage, Nathan made this famous statement, I care not what puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the British money supply. He went on to brag in to take control of the French money supply. In 1821, Kalman Rothschild was sent to Italy to do business with the Vatican and the Pope. By 1823, they had taken over the financial operations of the Catholic Church worldwide. It sounds like it to me that the Vatican the papacy is controlled by the Rothschilds. Who is the beast? In the 20th century, the next generation of Rothschilds became obsessed with the idea of returning Jews to their homeland in Israel. James Rothschild's youngest son, Edmund, initiated the process by funding the building of Jewish colonies in what had become known as Palestine. In 1897, the Zionist Congress was formed with the intention of promoting the establishment of a Jewish nation. It intended to meet in Munich, Germany, but when the local Jews heard about it, they protested so much that it had to be moved to Basel in Switzerland. The reason for the protest was that the Jews were quite comfortable in their adopted countries and had no intention of moving back. This led the chairman of the meeting, Theodore Herzl, to state, It is essential that the suffering of Jews become worse. This will assist in the realization of our plans. I have an excellent idea. I shall induce anti-Semites to liquidate Jewish wealth. The anti-Semites will assist us thereby in that they will strengthen the persecution and oppression of the Jews. The anti-Semites will be our best friends. So there was a conscious decision to have people turn on the Jews to make them uncomfortable in their adopted countries so that they would then have motivation to leave and go back to their homeland. Herzl was thereafter elected as the president of the Zionist organization, which adopted a red hexagram as their emblem. In 1901, the Jewish colonists began to feel like Edmund Rothschild was more of a hindrance than a help. They asked him to take a step back from the process to let them handle their own situation. Rothschild, demonstrating the controlling spirit of Jezebel, angrily retorted, I created the Yushuf, I alone, therefore no men, neither colonists or organisations have the right to interfere in my plans. A couple of years later, in 1903, the Zionist Congress astonishingly appeared to hint at World War I a full 11 years before it actually took place. Max Nordau said at this meeting, Let me tell you the following words as if I were showing you the rungs of a ladder leading upward and upward. Herzl, the Zionist Congress, the English Uganda Proposition, the Future World War, the Peace Conference, where, with the help of England, a free and Jewish Palestine will be created. In 1917, British Foreign Secretary and occultist Arthur Balfour issued the statement known as the Balfour Declaration. The declaration was addressed to Lord Rothschild, meaning the eldest son of Nathan Rothschild, Walter. It stated that Britain was in favour of establishing a Jewish settlement in Palestine. And so it was. After World War I came a peace conference held at Versailles and hosted by Edmund Rothschild. The issue of Palestine was raised at this conference and Britain handed the land over to the Rothschild of thinking. Vladimir Lenin, the communist leader, highlighted the fact that the war between capitalism and communism was just part of something much bigger when he said, I don't care what becomes of Russia. To hell with it. All this is only the road to a world revolution. 
Incidentally, the Third World War, in Albert Pike's vision, was said to happen between the Jews and the Muslims. Pike believed that supporters on both sides, already tiring of war from previous conflicts, would fight themselves into a state of mental, physical, spiritual and, very importantly, economic exhaustion. The world would then be ready for the coming Antichrist to save them from it all. Albert Pike said of that time that, We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a great social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to all nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origins of savagery and of most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the people will be forced to defend themselves against the world minority of the world revolutionaries and will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity whose spirits will be from that moment without direction and leadership and anxious for an ideal but without knowledge where to send its adoration will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer brought finally out into public view a manifestation which will result from a general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of atheism and Christianity, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Notice what he's saying here, that they would conquer and exterminate both Christianity and atheism at the same time. You see, the Enlightenment era that we've been studying in this third section gave birth to atheism, which is one of the hallmarks of the modern era. It was basically people trying to escape from God. But that period, defined by an increase in atheism, was only meant to be a temporary phase in the long-term plan, according to Pike. After the modern era, the world would then enter into what we now call the post-modern era, which is where we currently are today, a time in which people would move away from outright atheism towards strange religion, mystery religion. This represents the time when the mysteries would start to externalise themselves. They would gradually move out from the shadows and into the open. Mankind would come to be fed up with both Christianity and atheism and would return to the synthesized mystery religion. In this condition, they would be ready to finally accept the manifestation of Lucifer, the Antichrist. It looks like to me, not only is the Vatican in the hands of the Rothschilds because they got their money, also it looks like to me that Israel is in the hands of the Rothschilds. It looked like to me that the beast who we've been thinking is the beast is not the beast because the only somebody I see that's controlling the Vatican's money and the Israelites' money is who else but the Rothschilds. The, the money, our dollar bill, tells not the story of the Illuminati's but the story of the Rothschilds. 